Well, thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to the House this afternoon about the horrific situation unfolding in Ukraine and also about the Conservative motion that seeks further action in response. At the beginning of last week, my family had the pleasure of welcoming another child, Augusta Anthony Jenis, born in safe and approaching ideal circumstances. Thank you. Surrounded by family in a warm and secure place and with the assistance of a medical professional. And a couple days after that, following the vile and illegal invasion of Ukraine, I saw an image posted of a little baby born in a subway in Kiev where subways are being used as bomb shelters. It's hard to imagine, after our own experience, what it must be like for a family to have a child born in a subway turned into a bomb shelter. And, and I kept thinking about that juxtaposition, the experience of my child and the experience of this child. And the comparison of circumstances powerfully brought home for me the injustice of what is unfolding. A baby born in a subway, and yes, other images. A young couple getting married in a bomb shelter, and then immediately joining the territorial defense forces. Politicians, beauty queens, and everyone in between taking up arms for the defense of their country. A prime minister prepared to stand with his people no matter what the cost. Images demonstrating profound injustice, but also inspiring resilience. A will to survive, a will to endure. The Ukrainian people have faced so much injustice in their history, but they have always endured, preserving their faith and their hope. Faith and hope in God, in country, and in power within themselves to bend the arc of history towards justice. Madam Speaker, there is no difference between my child and the child born in Kiev subway, except the lottery of birth circumstances. It breaks my heart to think of what that mother and father must have gone through and be going through. But in one sense, I will say that that child is also profoundly blessed, blessed to be part of the great Ukrainian nation, a nation that will never die. And I stand today with all members of this House in deploring the violence going on and expressing my solidarity with the brave Ukrainian people in their ongoing struggle. As Stephen Harper said, whether it takes five months or 50 years, we will keep insisting on freedom and independence of the Ukrainian nation within secure borders established and agreed to in the Budapest Memorandum. Now, it starts with a commitment to solidarity and with prayers, must continue to include concrete action. The criminal Putin regime has a long history of seeking conflict and violence in order to counter its own unpopularity at home. This war was not a response to unmet demands or security concerns. Those demands kept shifting and ignored past commitments made by that same regime. This is a personal war of choice by a regime that wishes to distract attention from its own problems. This regime has failed to deliver on promises to improve the Russian economy and has instead used every tool at its disposal to enrich regime-connected elites instead of seeking the kind of broad-based growth that would benefit ordinary Russians. And now it is doing even more damage. This is a cynical and brutal war of choice, and the people of Russia have noticed large anti-aggression and pro-Ukraine protests happening inside Russia show that Putin's efforts to use a foreign war to rally support for his regime at home are failing. And this is encouraging news. I salute the courage of the thousands of Russians who have gone to protests and have already been punished by the regime. Alexei Navalny is calling on Russians to take to the streets, to fill prisons and paddy wagons with ourselves, and to fight against the war. This is the face of the true Russia, of people with the same aspirations for peace, freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, as we see in every country where the people are allowed to be heard. The internal opposition to Putin is growing, and the world must stand with that opposition by imposing debilitating sanctions, crippling the capacity of the Putin regime, and inducing even his former friends and collaborators to side with the opposition. As Ukrainians bravely fight Putin's invasion, and as Russians rise up to resist Putin's tyranny at home, we must do all that we can as well. All 
that we can do. Madam Speaker, I love Ukraine. But it must be said as well that this is not just about Ukraine. Ukraine is the front line in a fight that is truly global and that we must win. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have global agendas that seek to overturn hard-won norms of national sovereignty and international rules, and instead seek to create a reality in which power is the only law. President Xi is watching what happens in Ukraine to determine possible action against Taiwan. But the agendas of these leaders are not limited to Ukraine or to Taiwan or to the Baltic states or to the South China Sea or to the Canadian Arctic. These agendas are global. And as Winston Churchill said, appeasement is like feeding a crocodile in hopes that it will eat you last. Let's not made the, make the same mistake today that the appeasers made in the 1930s. We know what these might makes right agendas have led to if not confronted. They lead to global war, to the concentration camp, and to the gulag. We either stop this now, or we will be forced to stop it later. Inflicting a defeat on Putin today is not just vital for the survival of Ukraine. Inflicting a defeat on Putin today is necessary for preserving the peace and stability of a world in which power is not the only thing that matters. Ukraine will either be Putin's Afghanistan or Putin's Czechoslovakia. We must make sure that it's the former. So it's great to see the momentum and the solidarity in the House right now. But we have seen this in the case of past crises and how the will to respond can fade over time and as other issues come into the headlines. Responding to this attack on Ukraine and on international peace and stability is going to take time, endurance and sacrifice over the long term. We will need more and tougher sanctions the expansion of matching programs for humanitarian support to include more organizations, further diplomatic pressure to isolate the Putin regime, and support for the right of the Ukrainian people to determine their own international alignments through their own elected representatives. One critical area in which Canada can and must play a role is energy policy. And our motion today calls on the government to work to relieve the reliance of our European partners on Russian gas. Europe is heavily reliant on the import of Russian gas, and gas exports feed Putin's war machine. So it's time to starve Putin's war machine, and Canada can play a, a, an indispensable role by exporting its own natural gas, giving our European friends and allies an alternative. Now, some members of this House seem to think that we shouldn't be talking about gas exports right now, that we should focus instead on general expressions of solidarity instead of on pushing practical solutions like this that will weaken the Putin regime. I don't agree with that. I think now is, now must be the time to talk about what we can actually practically do to help Ukrainians and to starve Vladimir Putin's war machine. What is the point, after all, in expressing solidarity if it does not lead us to explore and to answer hard questions about what we can do specifically to stand with Ukraine and to weaken the war machine that is attacking the Ukrainian people. Now, it must be said there are some members of this House who are going to be ideologically opposed to certain energy developments in Canada regardless. But I ask all members to look at the particular facts of the situation in front of us, to recognize that increasing Canadian energy exports to Europe is, is vital for the security of the world. If we're going to win this fight against Vladimir Putin, if we, if we truly recognize the importance of Ukraine, we, we have to recognize just the magnitude of the impact of relieving Europe's dependence on Russian gas would have. And I want to say as well, Madam Speaker, I don't believe it's a choice between concern for the environment and concern for security. Some of our European partners right now, as an alternative to being too reliant on Russian gas, are also reliant on coal. And they face this, this challenging choice between Russian gas and coal. So, so Canadian natural gas is cleaner than coal, and it is better from a security perspective than Russian gas. It's a win-win. Madam Speaker, the stakes are so high, and I believe we must do all we can to stand with the Ukrainian people and to defend our values. Thank you.